there is a battle going on between the evolutionists and the creationists. From your writings, it seems both camps do not capture the real position. Just where did Darwin go wrong? In The Present Crisis, one of your most recent books, you say that Darwin is dead. Why do you say that? The explanation for the origin of life on the earth in the case of Darwinism is that it was the combination of certain elements more or less accidentally which created the first primary forms of life. In the case of the creationists, the position is that God created man in his own image. From my point of view, both the explanations are incorrect. The Darwinian hypothesis is weak because it could not be possible for an accidental product to attain to such remarkable variations and complexity during the course of the millions of years that have elapsed since life first appeared on the earth. It is not possible to believe that time after time an accidental mutation took place to bring about all the variety of life on the earth. It would be stretching chance too far. In fact, the odds against such a series of chance events taking place would be almost infinite. It is hard to believe that man could all of a sudden make appearance as if it had descended from the sky and start working on the earth as an intelligent human being. The record of fossils does not support this point of view. We see man as a half-cultured being, before that as a savage, and before that in almost subhuman forms in different parts of the earth. So there must have been some sort of a growth, some sort of an evolution from the time we are able to find signs of the first man to this day. There must have been a process of gradual development during all this period. Secondly, it is also before our eyes that in the case of the human child, it has to pass certain stages from the day of conception to the time it is born, born from the womb of the mother. It passes through different stages, like, say, a fish, a tadpole, a reptile, a quadruped, and then a man. The child stands erect at the last stage and also is able to talk, which it is not possible for you to do during the first couple of years. There we see nature repeating the process by which man appeared on the earth. But what we see, what the evolutionists ignore, is that the human seed is already oriented for these later manifestations, that like the seed of a tree, it contains the future man within it. A fertilized human oven would only produce a human child, not any other form of life or a lower animal or reptile or a fish. From this it is easy to infer that in the same way life must have started on the earth as a primordial seed which by subsequent steps reached to the stature of man or 
was built up in the various forms of life we meet on the earth. In other words, evolution is planned and not random as is held by the evolutionists. From my point of view, the reason for this attitude has been antagonism towards the concept of religion. It has been a sort of battle between those who believe in religion and those who inherently are opposed to it. Most of the evolutionists array their arguments in such a way as if evolution stands proved. It does not. There are still many gaps which have not been filled up so far. For instance, there is no explanation how the intellect developed in human beings. Darwin explains it by saying that it was due to accident or random mutation as in the other cases, but no detailed explanation for the fact is forthcoming either from him or any other evolutionist so far. Similarly, there is no explanation how the eye was formed, how there is such a complex organ as the organ of our sight. There are other facts which have not been explained so far and as we see day by day a greater opposition to the theory is mounting up from other biologists and scientists. At the present moment, the Darwinian hypothesis does not hold such a sway as it did maybe 50 years ago. I do not see any reason why we should not ascribe the phenomenon of life to the operation of an energy which is entirely dissimilar to the material energies which, with which we are surrounded everywhere. Our senses, all the five of them, can perceive only a very tiny fragment of the universe. There are animals and other lower forms of life which have some of the senses developed much more acutely than the senses of man. In the case of dogs, in the case of moths, whales, migratory birds, we find there are senses which inform them about their surroundings or about other matters as they do not do in the case of man and we have also no explanation for the sharpness and acuteness of their senses. We have also no knowledge about the brain, how it functions and what fuel sustains it in its day-to-day -day work. With these gaps in our knowledge, it seems to me to be unscientific to insist on a doctrine or a theory which still does not stand proven to the hilt. For this reason, I think it is better to have an open mind on this question, both in respect of the creationists and the evolutionists, and try to find an ex explanation which better suits the phenomena. So far as the crea creationist theory is concerned, it stands on the story of Genesis as contained in the Bible. It is not supported by the revealed material of the Vedas or even the Buddhists. In the Vedas, the explanation for the existence of man is more or less of the evolutionary kind. The spirit, the embodied spirit, starts from the lowest form of life and in a cycle of 840,000 lives, 
it completes the circle until reaches the stature of a man and there also its future depends on the karma that it does in a particular life so from that point of view the indian view is nearer to the theory of evolution with this difference that it is not the material elements but the spirit which evolves i believe that life is the product of another element of creation which is entirely dissimilar to the material elements the universe is not only what we perceive through our senses but it contains other energies and forces of which we have no awareness at all it is these energies and forces that come into play in psychic phenomena in the enlightenment of the great prophets of the earth and in other paranormal and or abnormal phenomena of the mind modern science has summarily rejected all experiences of religion for the simple reason that the scientists never experimented with religion itself if it were to do so on the lines as has been done in india for the last thousands of years i am sure that their attitude will change and they too will come to understand the force which is behind the phenomena of life in your various writings you have spoken of the law which governs our activity and the course of our civilization can you clarify what is the law what is digression from the law there is a growing tendency even among the scientists to believe that mind has an independent existence of its own that it is not an epiphenomenon or a product of the brain cells entirely but only the manifestation of a force which is beyond our comprehension at present in fact some of the psychologists have openly come out with this explanation of the mind william james is one of them macdougall is another the last named believes even in the existence of a soul now the point is if it is admitted that mind has an independent existence and that the human mind forms the part of a whole which is beyond our observation and that this mind continues to exist irrespective of our bodies it cannot be supposed that this world of the mind this reservoir or this ocean is without laws of its own it must have its own laws as we have laws in the physical universe religious revelation has come solely to bring this fact to the notice of mankind that there is something beyond the phenomenal world which is imperceptible to our eyes but which can be observed or experienced by means of certain disciplines and a righteous way of life this means there is a law which rules our destiny as human beings with a soul this law has been imperfectly and partially 
revealed in the various scriptures of mankind. It is my endeavor also to reveal this law as far as I have been able to observe during the whole course of my long experience of the state. Now, what is this law is very hard to be put precisely into words. But what type of a life this law demands, what type of behavior, what type of thinking, and what type of society is apparent and can be corroborated from a study of all the religions of mankind. What he demands is that human beings should lead a peaceful and harmonious life, moderate and according to principles which are for the good of other human beings and also the society as a whole. There should be no exploitation, no aggression, no action or thought which in any way affects the welfare of another human being. When we compare these commandments issued by the prophets of mankind based on their own experience of a higher state of consciousness, we, will, we can readily see that the present world is behaving and acting in a completely opposite way. That the present day competition, both as individuals and as the members of a nation or a group, the very reverse is the attitude for everyone tries to have the largest share of the earth's resources or of wealth, possession or whatever there may be of use or utility to him. This is a thing which is forbidden under the law which rules the evolution of the race. In view of man's scientific and technological advancements and the progress in so many aspects of his civilization, why does he seem to be even more deadened to the law than men of two or three hundred years before? In answering this question, we should first determine what is civilization. Does civilization mean technological advancement, learning, large towns, palatial buildings, lifts, motor cars, computers, and all other amenities and facilities which have been provided by science? Or does civilization mean sound, healthy, and morally perfected human beings? Does civilization mean earth transformed into an Adam in which selfish, egotistical, hard-hearted exploiters, black marketeers, criminals, aggressors reside are one simple with fields, natural environments, small even huts, but where there is peace, tranquility, happiness, health, long life, and love between the members of a society or of humanity as a whole. Which of the two would you prefer and which would you call real culture and civilization of mankind? Our whole concept of life is 
sometimes mistake. Nature does not care if we fly in aeroplanes, if we have computers, that we see the various form of life, we find that we cannot even compete with what she has created in the animal life. We cannot fly like an eagle. We cannot dive like a whale. We cannot be so beautiful as a peacock. The other variety of life all have their beauties, their agilities, and their special traits of character. It is not in building spaceships or computers or television that man can excel. It is in his perfection, in his developing more and more faculties, in his knowing more of the universe surrounding him. Otherwise, if he dresses himself in satin, eats creeps every day, resides in palaces, and has all the comfort of the flesh, and dies without knowing anything about himself, he is no better than an animal. There is no difference. Only there is a difference in the quality of the dress, of the food, of the sleep. That is all. Otherwise, he is as good as an animal. And I am afraid that is what the modern, I should say, a section of scientists tries to make of him. Man has not come to stagnate as an animal but to fly as an angel. He has come to become a god, while by our own wrong thinking and wrong stress on non-essentials, we make a beast of him. Monkeys can fly in aeroplanes. You can dress them in any beautiful dress you like. They can even perhaps, in course of time, manipulate computers and even machines with the proper practice. But you can never make men of them. What we need is men, thinking, noble men, compassionate, loving. If these traits are lost, do you know what the consequences will be? Self-destruction with the forces gained by the advance of science. The very instrument on which we boast our, or which we pride ourselves, this will become the cause of destruction of the race. Many of our present day technological advancements and inventions seem very superficial and even inimical to man's own well-being. Where did we go wrong? What rule of thumb can the average person use to decide what is beneficial and what is detrimental for his well-being in the long run? Our present-day technological advancement and inventions appear to us superficial and even inimical to man's well-being because we have overdone and used them to an immoderate degree which is a stumbling block to man's progress. What is lacking is wisdom. If we were to cast a glance at the history of mankind, we would find that every civilization of the past reached a certain zenith and then fell to the earth, never to rise again. Egyptians, Greeks, Romans, Indo-Aryans, and Chinese had almost arrived at the same point at which the modern Western civilization arrived in the 17th century, and in some cases even advanced beyond it. For instance, Egyptians had a knowledge of astronomy and arts of healing, which were attained by the 
modern scientists in the 18th century. But they fell. Their technological advancement and science did not save them from decay. A moment's reflection is sufficient to show that the more powers attained need a more disciplined mind to handle them. We went radically wrong when we devoted every ounce of our energy to gain more and more knowledge and control over the forces of nature, ignoring the fact that side by side we too had to reform and perfect ourselves. As if ordained by fate as a punishment for our arrogance, we at once at the same time did what is incredible. We rejected religion the only force that could help man in becoming more and more self-disciplined and perfect. The very foundation of religion rests on the self-perfection of every human being. We summarily rejected it as a false doctrine, as superstition, as a myth. And the result is that after 200 years of scientific triumphs, we are now face to face with a contingency where the annihilation of the whole race stares us in face. Science went wrong when it devoted its attention entirely to the physical world, ignoring the mind, its laws, and the fact that there are other powers and other forces which rule our inner being. This polarity in the attitude of science has resulted in the present crisis and it will not be solved unless man retraces his steps and starts again on the path which is destined for him. In your recent essay entitled, Professor von Weissacker, The Scientist of the Future, you write that a new breed of mystic scientists will emerge to guide the race. What qualities of mind must the rulers, thinkers, and scientists of the future hold during such a threatening period in mankind's existence? This is the heyday of science. During the last 50 years, science has made such an amazing progress as could not be imagined even in the 19th century. It has opened such possibilities before the eyes of man as could not even be dreamt of before. But what do we see so far as human beings and societies are concerned? Have men become more noble, more honest, kinder, or more benevolent to deal with? Or is the position the reverse of this? Is there love and enmity between nations, or we find hatred seething everywhere, even between neighbors and erstwhile friends. Do we not see the earth threatened by a disaster of unprecedented magnitude if a war breaks out? Do we also not see small fights, large-scale massacres, limited wars going on at many spots on the earth, each one of which is fraught with the gravest consequences for the peace of the earth. 
if this is the position in this age of scientific triumphs and technological victories, what will be the state of the society after another 25 or 30 years? It would most probably be more tense, more full of alarming situations, more critical, more threatening, and more fraught with danger than what it is today. How long can the human brain bear distress and tension and the risk of instantaneous annihilation during the coming centuries? When we look at the present world, with all the learning that it possesses, with all the knowledge that it has, with all the information that it has gained, does it not mean that there is something wrong in the leading figures, the leading intellectuals, and the leading spiritual teachers of the world, which is keeping mankind in such a state of ferment and tension every day? This is what I mean when I say that the future leaders should be mystical, should have the experience of their inner selves to understand life better than they are doing now. Man is not what he appears to be from his exterior or what we can know of him from the observation of his body and his physiology. He is something more. He is a soul. He is a mind. He is a conscious entity about which we have no knowledge at the moment. Therefore, it is those people alone who have greater knowledge of his soul, of his mind, of his consciousness, combined with the knowledge of his physiology and the world in which he lives, who will be able to guide him rightly on the path. It is not now those scientists, those politicians, those intellectuals who have only the knowledge of the physical world or of the, of the learning which deals with only material objective who can guide him, but those who have also the knowledge of his inner being. These people are very rare and scarce at present. What we need are mystics, or in other words, people who have had the experience which Christ or Buddha or Shankaracharya or Socrates underwent, coupled with full knowledge of temporal things who can guide the race in future. You have said that uh, evolution is planned and that once the idea of planned evolution becomes known, it could unite the creationists and the orthodox evolutionists. At the present moment, too, all biologists are not agreed upon the method by which evolution worked. There are many who believe that evolution is planned and does not, did not depend only on natural selection and the survival of the fittest as is held by Darwin. The fossil record does not support the idea that one species slowly developed into another species. There are no intermediary stages. Biologists like Mayer now say that the reason for lack of this evidence is because evolution has been rapid at times and the changes occurred so rapidly that no fossil record of the intermediary species is available. 
This is also something which is new to the general concept of evolution. According to the Darwinian hypothesis, astronomical spans of time were needed for primary forms to develop into more complex forms. And now another factor is being introduced that where there was a diversification of one species into another, the changes took place very rapidly. So we see that evolutionists are trying to give arguments in support of the thesis that evolution occurred by random occasion and by natural selection. On the contrary, the evidence provided by science, even in the case of DNA and RNA, is that the combinations that have occurred are so complex that we cannot evoke mere chance to account for them. In some cases, there are such complexities in these compounds that the odds are one against billions that these combinations could occur of themselves. There are many, many loopholes in the theory of evolution. Let us take the case of the human brain. There was no urgency, no necessity from the survival point of view for the ape to be transformed into a human being. The difference between a higher animal and a human being from the point of view of brain and mind is so great and so marked that mere chance cannot be held to account for it. There must be other factors which are not being discussed by biologists in their treatises on the development of the intellect. Neither Darwin, nor any of his successors, nor modern biologists like Carl Sagan have been able to account for the development of the intellect. It is a mystery, as great now as it was in the past. There is no reason whatsoever why the anthropoids or a section of them could suddenly develop something like intelligence and thought as we see in the human species. There is no explanation for it whatsoever from the side of the biologist. They attribute it again to random mutations working through uncomputable spans of time. Why should we not accept a more rational view that evolution is planned? What hinders us from accepting what has been held all along that there is an intelligence operating behind the universe. The human intelligence is not perceptible by any means whatsoever. We cannot weigh our mind, we cannot taste our mind, we cannot touch our mind, we cannot hear our mind. It is something which no instrument can detect. Why do not we concede that Intelligence, even in a more subtle and rarer form, can exist all over the universe. Why should we ascribe the laws of nature only to blind matter? We surely could not have any laws as laws and insentience are incompatible. The very fact that matter is governed by laws indicates intelligence. There can be no law or order in a creation that has no intelligence whatsoever in its composition. According to the Indian tradition, even matter is a manifestation of intelligence. There is a downward descent from intelligence towards matter and then again an ascent 
from matter in the form of plants, then animals, and then man towards the highest intelligence possible in the universe. So, what is happening is that the pure intelligence behind creation descends, envelops itself, or veils itself in matter, and then in the process of evolution emerges first as plants, then as animals, and then as man. And finally in man it has to recognize itself once again as the intelligence behind the universe. One system of Shiva philosophy is known as the system of recognition, which means that with proper disciplines a human being can reach a state of mind where he can recognize himself as the intelligence behind the universe, where he can recognize himself not as matter, nor as body, nor as a limited unit of consciousness, but as a cosmic intelligence behind the play of nature. This school is very famous and it has had many great authorities which have subscribed to this way. There seems to be no reason why humanity should not recognize that considering the intelligent nature of the universe, the laws that rule it, and the life that has sprung out of it, that there is an intelligence beyond our thought, beyond the probe of our senses, prevailing in the whole creation of which we are the products. Instead of denying to ourselves the status of intelligent beings, sparks of a divine, subs divine fire, or fragments of a divine substance, why should we condemn ourselves to eternal darkness and believe that we are sprung from mud and slush and mud and um, dust and other elements of nature which have no sentience in them? This perverse view is at the basis of much of the wrong thinking which is at the back of the present crisis. Because once man believes that there is no power to see or oversee his actions, he is likely to give heel to the temptations of flesh, to his passions, to his desires, because he believes then that this is the only life for him and why he should not enjoy it to the full before he passes away and becomes earth again. The Darwinian theory of evolution is superficial and does not take into account the profundities of consciousness. If man has arrived at his present mental stage by random mutations, and natural selection, there is no reason why his mind should be so profound and so multi-sided as we find it to be. There is no reason why there should be ideas of beauty, why there should be ideas of divinity, sublimity, of aesthetics, of the sense of right and wrong, of such insights, such intellectual efforts, which have now reached to the outermost limits of space. We cannot believe that mere concoction of some elements could create such a precise consciousness which gives existence to the universe which invests with laws, which sees it from the atom to the sun, 
which sums up the whole creation in a manner which is incredible. What purpose does it serve if man is a philosopher, if man is a great scientist, if he is a great poet, if he is a great uh, literary master? What purpose is, does it serve for survival? So far, as survival is concerned, a shelter, filling of the belly, some clothes is all that he needed for which his mind should work. Why all this aesthetics, this philosophy, this art, this science? Who has implanted this in the dust? How can consciousness with all its manifold manifestations, with its profundity, with its arts and philosophy, be ascribed to the concoction of a few elements which have no sentience in them at all. It is because the profundity of life is not understood by certain minds that they insist on an interpretation of evolution as we see in the textbooks of our day. Let us assume now that all this mind and intellect have developed from small beginnings, by culture. How can you account for inspiration and genius? How can you lend credence to the statements of all, of most of the geniuses themselves that they received this, the poems, or the novels, or the uh, works of art, or their composition in a flash? complete in every respect, and that they had not to labor on it, what part of our mind gives us finished compositions, chapters, and poetic pieces? How do they come? What explanation have biologists for this phenomenon? They just brush it aside. They just, by saying that it comes from the unconscious, but when we ask them, what is unconscious? They have no answer to it. If unconscious is the repository of our past experiences, how can you talk of the future? How can you talk of aesthetics? How can it give us new pieces of poetry, of music, of art, of beauty and aesthetics? How can it do? Unless there is a source of intelligence from which it draws. It is my effort to demonstrate this source of inspiration, revelation, this source of beauty, of aesthetics, and of philosophy, art, and science in the mind of man. Recently, you opened the Kundalini Experimental Center in Dehradun, India, where you proposed to begin experiments to scientifically verify the phenomenon of mystical experience. Please describe the lifestyle you envisage for the participants of such a center. Before I answer this question, a few words are necessary to show why this experimental center has been opened in Dehradun. From my own experience, I can confidently assert that there is a psychosomatic mechanism in the human body which is operative in the race and which can be accelerated with certain disciplines as has been done by thousands of yogis in India during the last might be 3,000 years. This center of psychic energy is responsible in the normal human beings for genius and psychic gifts. In fact, all great mystics and enlightened sages of the past were in possession of an active center which raised them to the level of a new dimension of consciousness. In that dimension, they could experience what is hidden from the normal vision of human beings. It is for this reason 
that every religious book, every mand mandate from the spiritual prodigies is in a mandatory tone because the message they conveyed was received from a higher source of consciousness which gave them the confidence that it was infallible. If it had been the result of their own reasoning, they would have been more cautious in their expression and tried to argue out what they were saying. But we find that the religious scriptures are written in an authoritative tone as if what the prophets are revealing has the sanction of a power or a mind which was far above their own. The aim of this experimental center is to prove that this power center exists in the human body and that it is operative in the race to raise it to a higher level of perception. Once this is proved, the whole outlook of science will change. Now, what kind of participants will be needed for this experiment? Naturally, those mentioned in the scriptures of mankind, those who are fit for the kingdom of heaven, for nirvana, for approach to God, or for the experience of Brahman. Men pure in heart, honest in deed, noble, compassionate, truthful, humble, charitable. These are the type of men for whom success will be speedy and also healthy. Otherwise, if the human mind is not ethically pure, noble, loving and compassionate, there is every danger of the practices miscarrying and landing the candidate in grave difficulties. In order to avoid this, we will have to be very selective in our choice of the candidates. The second reason why Dehradun was selected is because of its moderate climate. The moment they are given these intensive practices, there is every likelihood that at least some of them will experience internal changes and transformations for which a very moderate climate and healthy surrounding is necessary. The lifestyle that I envisage for these candidates is a normal, moderate life. They can live like normal human beings in every way, but with a certain measure of discipline and moderation in a way that does not affect their, either their mental or physical health. They can have, in a moderate way, all the pleasures of life, but they have to cultivate the cardinal virtues, for those are an essential condition of higher consciousness. We shall keep them busy in various activities, they shall have every kind of recreation. They shall have freedom to eat what they choose, provided it is healthy and nutritive in the right sense of the term. They can sport, they can play, they can have music or other forms of aesthetic enjoyment. Also, they can even live in couples with moderation and proper, healthy uh, thoughts and ideals. They can live normal human lives, but they shall have to be physically strong, mentally sound, and imbued with a spirit of self-sacrifice 
and service of mankind. What kind of a person would be suitable as a candidate for the experiments in terms of age and their disposition, background, and that sort of thing? It would be preferable if the candidates are young in age, say between 18 and 35 years. Also, if they are of a kindly, benevolent disposition, with a passion for religious experience, they should also have a background of a desire from an early age for perfecting themselves or for reaching a stage where they can dedicate their life to a noble cause. It is people of this temperament who are not selfish, egotistical, proud, or who do not bear malice, hate, or envy in their heart, hearts that have a greater chance to be successful in this experiment. Must a candidate for this research have some psychic or spiritual experience to be eligible? It is not necessary. What is necessary are noble traits of mind, a passion for religious experience and a desire to be of service to mankind. Often it is seen that a person who experiences many psychic or spiritual sensations in their lives, or one who has had an intense spiritual fervor, has difficulties in stabilizing their personalities. Would such a person be a valuable candidate for the experiments? The people who have psychic or spiritual experiences often have an activated Kundalini. An activated Kundalini imposes certain conditions on the body which must be fulfilled by the subject. Since the knowledge of this mysterious mechanism is not known and this whole phenomenon is shrouded in mystery, those who had an active Kundalini accept yogis who know what is happening in their interior have been hysterical, neurotic, unstable, with pathological symptoms or even downright insane. This is the reason why in the men and women of genius and in the great mystics, both the result of the activation of Kundalini. There have been many who have been unstable, neurotic, or even downright disoriented. In the case of geniuses, a large percentage, maybe above 90, have been people who were eccentric in their behavior, or who one time or the other had mental problems and even spent their days in mental clinics. The same is true of mystics also, only since mystics have been treated as a class apart, or in other words, those who had communion with divinity or God, their madness or eccentricity has been ascribed to spiritual or God intoxication, while in actual fact both mystics and geniuses under the impact of an awakened Kundalini are not able to maintain their balance like average human beings. They need special lifestyles, special ways of thinking, special ways of behavior, discipline and moderation 
to new healthy sound and happy lives with the gifts that they possess the experiments i have in view will give us much more information about the lifestyles which those with ancient kudalinis have to follow for this reason people who already are neurotic are unstable with the experiences they have had will not be suitable candidates for the experiment it would be better to have sound body and sane candidates who are able to bear the stress and pressure of the awakening and the new experiences which they enter it would take a long time before we have hundreds of successful candidates but we have to consider that awakening of kundalini means acceleration of the evolutionary processes at work in the human frame it is not an easy undertaking generations will be needed for the emergence of candidates who are perfectly suited for the experiment it will not be only the candidates who will be able to achieve that state of perfection which is needed for the experiments but a part of this work will have it have to be done by their parents also this is the most potent method for ensuring that generation after generation there is an attempt at self perfection among human beings more than wealth or property people will believe that it is better to leave a healthy heredity with the child than unnecessary and super abundant wealth or position will meditation be taught at the center and if so what kind of meditational practices will be taught for the most part meditation will certainly be taught and practiced at the center because meditation is perhaps the most potent method for the arousal of kundalini along with the meditation there are also other exercises which make concentration more intense the effort will be to give intensive forms of meditation which affect the awakening of kundalini in a very effective way but one has always to keep in view the danger of an abrupt awakening therefore every possible effort will be made to arrange the practices in such a graduated form that the risk is minimized i don't think it will be possible to achieve results in even one or two years of intensive meditation but might be a period of five or six years will be necessary for those candidates who already have the seeds of the awakening in them and whose nervous systems have attained a stage of maturity where the awakening is possible in a healthy way more and more people are reporting having visionary experiences sensations of light and sound electrical sensations in the body and energies enveloping the whole system how do these relate to the phenomenon of higher consciousness are there various levels or degrees of higher consciousness as i have said the mechanism of kundalini is operative in all the rays where the conditions are favorable especially in the case of the highly talented and gifted individuals 
the operation is accelerated. In many people, as the result of this activity, which is unknown to them and even unknown to science, there are visionary and other experiences which tell them that something new is happening in their mind, but of which they are not able to locate the reason. There are many people who write to us also, describing experiences of this kind, heat in the system, currents going up the spine, lights before the eyes, sound in the ears, and other symptoms of an awakened Kundalini. These people, when once this knowledge becomes widely known, would be able to understand their own condition and also to use the method that can bear the best fruit for them. I've read recently, even as recently as a month ago, uh, one of the major magazines in the United States called Omni carried an interview with Professor Ernst Mayer yes. of Harvard University. Yeah. He's an internationally known evolutionist, yes. and he claims that the brain is no longer evolving, it's merely changing. And he says it's entirely wrong to say that we are evolving to a higher level. Mm -hmm. We are merely changing. Uh, so this would contradict what you are saying. This is also a paradox. Mayer is a scientist, and a scientist is expected to say what is proven. Science means proven knowledge. But what you find at this moment is scientists indulging in guesses, speculations, and theories than even other men. Now, science know nothing about the brain yet. The brain is a mystery. You can see any book on the brain and you will find the brain experts all write that there is much, much to be understood about the brain. This is a large frontier between science and the knowledge of the universe. How could the mayor say that the brain is not evolving when it is not possible for him to scrutinize the brain? How does he? Brain for this knowledge needs internal observation, and science has rejected that internal observation on the basis of which I am saying that the brain is evolved. Unless scientists try this method and fail, then of course I will feel that I was in the wrong. But so long oh, as they only theorize and speculate, we cannot accept what they say at face value. So Mr. Mayer is repeating the same old tale, but on the other hand you have other scientists who say that the brain is evolving, like Salk. Professor uh, or Dr. Jonas Salk. Yeah, he has written that brain is evolving, only in, a, in, a, in another magazine. So whom to believe, Salk or Mayer? And scientists are contradicting themselves, for instance, what explanation they have for this gulf between the Stone Age, age man and the present man. If they say man has not evolved, how this difference in the intellectual ability of the two? Well, I think they try to explain that by merely giving it the term social evolution. Yeah, fine, but without the neurons. Does it mean that the mind can reach higher states of thinking without in any way affecting the brain? If that is a fact, then all their theories are wrong. The neurons are not directly involved. It means that the mind is something else than the brain. I suppose they have merely accepted the idea that the weight of the brain or the size of the skull determines the uh, evolution, the evolutionary the, state. The, the size? Absolutely incorrect. As this new book says that in the majority of cases, the brain weight of the geniuses, the brain size, has been even sometimes less than the average. The size and the shape of the brain does not determine 
the the quality of thought or the quality of the mind they are in the dark because the brain is fed by a power by an energy which is absolutely beyond the sensory probe of human beings it is that energy which determines the quality of mind not the brain cells but it is that energy which science has not been able to uh, measure or to even detect. it will never be able with these methods some other methods will have to be devised to explore the brain not with the normal methods they will only come against a rock they will only see the neurons they will see their connections but they will never be able to measure or to know that which animates the neuron as they are never able to see or know that which animates the human body the same thing the same mind which animates the human body animates the brain also but you cannot see it by any means but you say another method has to be devised yeah, the, by the inner method of observation but that is the subjective method and that's antithetical to science you see this is a frontier where man has to perfect himself before he can observe the brain this is the frontier man will continue to strike his head against rocks to know himself to know the mystery of his brain but he will never succeed unless he disciplines himself purifies his heart and then looks within his own self so the main exercise would be to purify the heart to follow the revelations of the great saviors of man to live that life 